Hello everyone, welcome to the course on computer aided drug design. We will continue on the topic of drug likeness. So, we saw many factors that contribute towards the drug likeness property. The first one was uh, PGB efflux, uh, there these are proteins, P glycoprotein proteins in the cell membrane that pumps many foreign substances out of the cells. So, they act like an efflux pump. So, the drug also gets efflexed. Then uh, we have to consider the metabolism and biotransformation um, that are taking place inside uh, in the liver, um, enzymes like oxidoreductases, hydroxylation. So, it uh, affects the drug, drug may become more active or less active, the metabolites could be toxic. So, we need to understand that. Plasma stability, uh, we have a lot of hydrolytic enzymes in the plasma region. Again, they may be uh, modifying the structure of the drug and uh, making it inactive. Plasma binding, there are a lot of uh, proteins in the plasma like human serum albumin, alpha acid glycoprotein, lipoprotein. So, organic anions like carboxylic acids, phenols bind strongly to human serum albumin, whereas amines and hydrophobic compounds bind to AGP, um, steroids they bind to AGP. So, the um, bioavailability of the drug may go down. Then um, there was another concept called HERG blocking. These are uh, proteins which are involved in potassium uh, signaling and um, again uh, which is uh, in, in turn uh, in combined with the, the uh, electric activity of the heart and hence the uh, heart beat. So, any disturbance um, drugs blocking this particular protein will affect the heart beat, heart rhythm okay. um, and hence you need to know whether the drugs have any effect on the uh, cardiovascular activity. Then toxicity, toxicity is uh, related to whether the drug has uh, short term, long term toxicity, genotoxicity, cytotoxicity um, and so on. So, we need to understand those aspects as well. So, all these contributes to the drug likeness property. Uh, like I mentioned there is a software which uh, tries to predict uh, toxicity properties, it provides fragments to aid interpreting prediction, this is uh, the particular uh, link for that, I will just show you that. Um, so, we have uh, the, it is called a COFFER, so it can predict lot of toxicities as you can see, AMS test mutagenicity, carcinogenicity, um, then estrogen tyrosine protein kinase uh, inhibition, uh, cytochrome P450, so a lot of uh, these. For example, um, let me see MS test mutagenicity, okay. Uh, so, you want to know whether uh, your compound which you are trying to um, is uh, mutagenic. Um, I went to zinc database, I picked up uh, say metformin and then I copy the smiles notation and then I can put that uh, here. Okay, then uh, I can say predict. So it gives you mutagen, non-mutagen. Okay, so it tells that uh, some of these uh, um, fragments are there in uh, present in the test compound. Okay, uh, they may be activating. Okay, they may be contributing towards mutagenicity as you can see some of these some of these groups here. When you have the red color here it means that actually and it also gives little bit information about the compound here information. Um, so, you can spend more time we can look at a lot of a different carcinogenicity in mouse model. Okay, again we can put in the okay, it gives you a prediction. So, you can see that a lot of these uh, fragments are also part of the um, carcinogenic um, activity. It has an activating effect, okay. okay it has an activating effect. Uh, so, a lot of the information is available. Um, so, they may be contributing to the carcinogenicity in uh, some uh, MOS model. So, we can look at a large number of uh, um, okay, predictions using this uh, fingerprint based method, okay. We can even look at uh, say cytochrome P450 
as I had showed before, cytochrome P450 is involved in uh, okay, many of these activities. So, we can predict whether these compounds are uh, part of the cytochrome P450 um, activating. So, this uh, software can give you a lot of information so that predicts chemical component plate fragments and add into prediction. Okay. So, it not only looks at the whole compound, it looks at the fragments that are uh, that could form from that particular compound and then tries to predict the properties of those fragments. Okay. So, um, this is a useful tool and there are many uh, toxicity predicting tools uh, available online free of charge. So, you can test check out your compound also. Okay. Um, so, drug likeness lead like compounds, there are many rules just like we looked at Lipinski's rule and Muge rule and things like that. This is called uh, uh, Opria rule of 3, uh, 2001 molecular weight should be less than 300. As you can see Lipinski's rule, uh, we said uh, less than 500, log p less than 3, so again uh, log p also has become very stringent number of hydrogen bond donors less than 3, number of hydrogen bond acceptors 3. So, they seem to have all 3 coming flexible bonds 3, they bring in another parameter called flexible bond, polar surface area less than 60 angstrom. Okay. So, according to them uh, the molecule should have uh, this type of uh, behavior. Um, why this polar surface area? If you remember the graph I showed you once um, as the polar surface area increases the permeability um, through the GI goes down. So, one would like to operate in this region right. That is why polar surface area is left uh, low, um, but uh, this rule is more stringent than uh, as you can see Lipinski's rule. There is another rule that is called Han et al rule, bioavailability greater than 30, clearance less than 30 ml per minute per kg in rat log D at 7.4 should be this, binding to cytochrome should be low, plasma protein binding should be less than 99.5, acute and chronic toxicity none, genotoxicity, uh, carcinogenicity, tetragenicity none at dose 5 to 10 times the therapeutic window. So, this is very important. Um, generally, um, we always operate one tenth of the toxic limits generally. Okay. So, that is the Han et al rule for uh, drug likeness property. Here you have the OPRA rule of uh, 3 for drug likeness. There is another rule called Egan et al. Uh, they say bad or good oral bioavailability rule. Okay. So, they say um, total polar surface area should be less than 132. Um, okay. So, 132 may be falling here okay, a little bit more whereas, uh, OPRIA rule is very stringent less than 60. Uh, log p between minus 1 to less than um, 6. So, you see um, this is another rule which tells you um, what should be a good uh, uh, descriptor or parameters for uh, a molecule to have good oral bioavailability and drug likeness property. Okay. Um, so, there is uh, um, another freeware it is called ADMA tox filtering tool FAF drugs 4 is a program for filtering large compound libraries prior to in silico screening. So, we can screen large number of uh, compounds. This is the um, link for that. I will just show you that, um, I will show you that link also for you to look at. Okay, this is the yeah, FFF drugs 4. Um, so, it gives you a lot of uh, calculations possibilities. Uh, we can look at ADME talks we can use a physical chem descriptors as you can see um, molecular weight log p log d log solubility polar surface area hydrogen bond donors hydrogen bond acceptors uh, total hydrogen bond number of uh, okay rings small set of smaller rings biggest system ring number of rotatable bonds carbon atoms hetero atoms um, hetero means uh, hydrogen not included number of heavy atoms and carb hetero to carbon atom ratio, Egan's rule, oral physical chemistry. Um, so, we can do a lot of uh, descriptor calculations, okay. we can even uh, do filtering based on the descriptors. Okay. Um, so, let us look at uh, a system RAN FAF. So, when you say RAN uh, it gives you like this. So, imagine I am uploading a structure 
uh, I can upload it, choose a file, um, uh, I can go to computer, computer, it needs a SDF file, so I am loading a SDF file. This is a Bextra, this is a um, selective cycle oxygen H2 inhibitor, okay. So, I have loaded this file um, and then I can do a lot of calculations here as you can go down. Uh, we can say log p computation, uh, then, then we can look at uh, filter, filtering possibilities here. Um, Okay, no, no, so uh, we can say just run. So, it calculates so it does a lot of calculations and then it gives you a lot of properties. Um, so, if you have many molecules um, put in. Okay, so, it does a lot of these uh, calculations, molecular weight, log P, log D, uh, solubilities, rotatable bond, rigid bonds, flexibility, donors, acceptors, um, okay. So, a lot of information it gives about the compound. As you can see, hydrogen bond, heteroatoms, total charge, heavy atoms, carbon atom. Um, then uh, it gives you oral bioavailability is good, Egan rule is also good, okay. Um, so, if I have lot of 30 molecules or more, I can even prepare uh, histograms showing uh, a particular property, uh, the histogram of a particular property. I can put a histogram of log P or I can put a histogram based on log S and so on actually, okay. So, this is a very good software uh, for uh, one to um, study the drug likeness property, try to collect information on uh, various uh, um, descriptors and it is a freeware, okay. So, we looked at quite a lot about uh, uh, the drug likeness, the um, bio oral bioavailability uh, and uh, what are the issues related when the drug travels uh, from the oral um, cavity right up to the target site, how the pH changes, how the solubility changes, how it may get biotransformed because of presence of enzyme or it may be getting absorbed in plasma region um, and what are the side effects it would cause especially to cardiac or create toxicity and so on. Okay, let us look at um, uh, another important uh, um, subject, it is called bioisosters. Okay, this uh, what is this bioisosters? This is the phenomena observed between substances structurally related. Okay, so when they are structurally related, they will have similar or antagonistic biological properties. This is what is called bioisosters. So if they are structurally related, chances are they will exhibit similar uh, biological property. So these isosters are elements, molecules, or ions which have the same number of electrons at the valence level, okay. So, if they have same number of electrons at the valence level, uh, the chances are they may exhibit similar property. That is what is uh, the concept of bioisosters and it is very useful when you are doing drug design, okay. Or uh, a chemical group can be mimicked by a similar group, that is what is bioisosters. So, um, so this and this are bioisosters because you have uh, here uh, uh, double bond here dio. So, chances are they may have similar biological properties. So, if you have a molecule with this uh, as a group, if I replace it with this group, chances are it will have similar biological activity, okay. Um, so, for example, look at this, these are all antibacterial sulfa based drugs, okay. So, this portion is the same. So, there are just a difference here, okay piperidine and then some heterocycle nitrogen oxygen heterocycle okay so these groups can be replaced against each other and you get a similar activity 
look at this uh, I had shown this long time back these are selective cyclooxygenase 2 drugs these are manufactured by Pfizer and Merck and so on silicoxib, uh, itiracoxib, validicoxib look at this uh, they have see the diaryl all of them and then there is a heterocycle group here okay five member or even six member heterocycle uh, six member okay. So, these compounds have similar activity not exact activity similar activity. Um, so, these can be called bioisosters analgesic nicotine ABT41857 this is a clinical trial drug look at this okay these are all these two are bioisosters anti ulcer this portion is the same um, aramotodome and nizatidine look at this the heterocycles are different this is an oxygen 5 member this is a di nitro 5 member drinks. This is a male erectile dysfunction drug ok sildenafil verdinafil ok look at this this portion is the same so this portion has been replaced and they exhibit similar activity. So, sulfenamide for example, an active metabolite of uh, prontosil, an antibacterial similar in structure to uh, para amino benzoic acid look at, so uh, this is a substrate of bacteria uh, this is the sulfa drug which was designed to mimic uh, the substrate. So, it goes and binds to the same active site and kills the bacteria ok. These are sulfa drugs which were discovered long time back after the first world war they are competitive inhibitors. So, um, there is a Grimm's hydride displacement law according to that law um, these are bioisosters these are bioisosters these are bioisosters. So, what does it mean um, if I have a molecule with the OH group um, I can replace it with NH2 um, then I expect it to have similar activity or I can replace it with CH3 and expect it to have similar activity. Of course, uh, the other properties may change will change of course, because um, hydrophilic to hydrophobic. So, solubility may change total polar surface area may change hydrobone acceptor donation change, but we are talking about um, bioactivity bioisosters talk only about bioactivity. So, I could come up with new structures um, because maybe uh, some properties are not good. Um, so, I want to make it more hydrophobic for example. So, I may replace a, a NH2 with CH3 expect it to have similar activity, but as you know um, it is no more a hydrogen bond acceptor it is more hydrophobic as well. So, some of the other um, drug likeness property may change. So, uh, same here. NH can be replaced by CH2 um, ok. So, these are bioisosters based on these and hence we can design new molecules and expect um, to maintain the activity same, but change the other properties like solubility maybe log P may be um, hydrogen bond accepting capability or hydrogen bond donating capability. So, all these could be changed. Uh, if I know what are the bioisosters of certain functional groups uh, where I showed you a lot of examples of ok. Uh, classic bioisosters these are called classic bioisosters um, so like a monovalent atoms or group, divalent atoms or group, trivalent atoms or group, tetra substituted atoms, ring equivalents all these are classic bioisosters as you can see here ok. Look at this of course, you also have non classic bioisosters cyclic versus non cyclic functional groups retro retro isosterism. So, we have uh, groups which fall into this category ok. So, these are called bioisosters. Uh, so, the more great advantage of it is I if I know which groups could be replaced by its own bioisoster. Um, I expect uh, the compound to have this similar activity, um, but it will alter my other properties the drug likeness property, physical chemical properties um, based on the type of functional groups I am 
uh, replacing it with. So, bioisosterism is very nice trick to play on molecules to change these properties, uh, but maintain your activity similar. Now, another important concept which has become very important in the past uh, 5 to 10 years I would say, this is called pan assay interference compounds P A I N S. What does this pan assay interference compound means? Uh, when we do high throughput screening, we get sometimes irrelevant positives, false positives, frequent heaters, um, okay, irrelevant compounds that interfere with the assay technology. Okay. So, it is not uh, actually doing a biochemical inhibition of an enzyme, suppose we are doing an enzyme assay with some compound, it is not actually working on the enzyme, but it may be interfering with the assay. For example, it may be absorbing or fluorescing at the assay wavelengths or compounds that interfere with the assay components in a pharmacological irrelevant manner okay. or it may be aggregating the protein, denaturing the protein. So, it, but it may appear as a hit when I do the um, screening, false positives, compound with a high probability of acting in a non-specific manner, okay. Okay, it is not acting very specifically either as a competitive inhibitor or allosteric non-competitive. Frequent heaters, okay, it seems to be appearing in many uh, irrelevant uh, screens, okay, they are called pains false positive. Techniques for identifying false negative can also be implemented and the compounds identified be reassessed, okay, especially when we are doing this type of things. Okay, let us go more deeper into that. Um, this pan assay interference compounds, their ability to show activity across a range of assay platforms and against a range of proteins. So, you may be doing a study on uh, proteins in the inflammation or you may be doing study on uh, um, something else maybe cardiovascular. The same compound may be appearing in many, many places um, not because they are uh, inhibiting this protein, but maybe they are affecting the assay itself either fluorescing or absorbing in the same element. Repeated identification of the same type of molecule as promising hit. So, it may appear as a promising hit against different protein. So, obviously, in such situations you have to be uh, careful. Most pain function as reactive chemicals rather than discriminating drugs. So, they may be reacting, they may be denaturing the protein or aggregating the protein rather than actually uh, performing as a drug. For example, this is a very, very uh, can, um, okay, dangerous candidate, um, rhodamine. There are 2132 rhodamines reported as having biological activity in huge number of publications, rhodanines. Rhodanines, so it may be thought as if they are very good for therapeutic development, but actually they undergo light induced reactions that irreversibly modify the protein. Okay. So, the protein um, gets uh, denatured, they get modified. Whereas, uh, when we do the assay with in the presence of rhodanines, uh, you may think they are acting on the protein. So, they appear to be promising for therapeutic development and they seem to have a lot of biological. So, rhodanine there are almost 2000 of them. So, they are not really um, compounds that may be taken up as a drug, but these are compounds which affect your assay, which affect your protein in an irreversible manner. Okay. They are called the uh, pan assay interference compounds. There are many compounds of, this, of that nature, okay. many nitrogen containing uh, uh, with the double bonds and so on. Look at this, okay. a Lo lot of these so 5 member nitrogen double bonds, nitrogen double bonds. Uh, huge number of compounds. There are softwares um, um, freewares where you upload your compound and um, it tells you whether your compound may be a uh, interfering compound, okay. pan assay interfering compound. Okay. This, if your compound has these type of functionalities, you better watch out, it may be a um, interfering compound. Okay. So, this software, this is what I said, if you go to this software, you can upload your structures and be sure uh, possibly whether it is a pan uh, pains compound or not. So, how do we detect pains? We have to look at literature substructure search, 
we need to do some binding studies if uh, you are doing a protein based uh, uh, biochemical assay um, if you think one compound is showing good activity it is good to do a binding kinetics ok. That means you change the concentration of the substrate, concentration of the inhibitor and see whether it follows uh, the Michaelis Menten. So, that is the binding kinetics. So, from there you will exactly find out uh, whether your compound comes under this category of paints. Activity in biochemical and cell based assay. So, you do the biochemical and then go to cell based assays also. So, screening using orthogonal assay. So, ok you have found a hit in one particular assay. Now, try an assay which is totally different um, orthogonally different and then see whether your compound shows. Convincing SAR. So, if you have a compound which shows activity then if I do structural modifications uh, electron withdrawing, electron donating or hydrophobic, hydrophilic do I get a good structure activity relationship. If not then you better be careful that it could be a uh, Payne's compound ok. So, you need to be very sure that uh, your compound does not um, fall under this category and it is a genuine inhibitor uh, for a particular protein of which you are studying ok. So, this uh, concept of pains has become very important in the past uh, 10 years um, so that uh, you do not end up with uh, some false positives uh, uh, in your uh, screening uh, protocols ok. So, we will continue more in the next class. Thank you very much for your time.